En la entrevista de hoy vamos a hablar con John Wick. John Wick participó de la creación de Leyenda de los Cinco Anillos. Primero el juego de cartas coleccionables, después el juego de rol. También es el creador de Séptimo Mar, ese juego de espadachines, de piratas, basado en las películas de Errol Flynn, o ahora podríamos hablar de piratas del Caribe, pero se dedicó a otras cosas también. Participó de Neopets, por ejemplo, escribió las tramas de ese gran juego de video que se jugaba por internet que tantos habrán jugado en sus navegadores y también últimamente se dedicó a escribir guías, por ejemplo, de cómo masteriar Houses of the Bloody, un juego de terror que se juega con un control remoto, pero es una persona controvertida, una persona que genera debate dentro de la escena del rol. Bueno, lo vamos a ver porque según él mismo dice, juega sucio. Quédate ahí y mira esta entrevista. John, there is a question that everybody that interviewed you asks of you, and it goes back to that early John uh, with ten dollars in his pocket that goes to Spencer's gifts and <laughs> finds the Call of Cthulhu manual. I know that this, this is a a really a boring question, if if you'd <laughs> like, but there is something I uh, I really wanted to ask you about this. Uh, You always say that the Call of Cthulhu uh, game um, was, uh, in some way, one that that really informed you. That's the the word mm -hmm. you say uh, a lot. Uh, it was your gateway drug to to enter in the TTRPG space. I always wanted to ask: Is you think you would have known about TTRPGs if you hadn't found that manual? I mean, did you have any? contact any friends that play TTRPGs, uh, any uh, other way to know about it? Or was it coincidence or causality that brought you to, to the hobby? It was serendipity. It was, uh, I was living in Iowa at the time, um, which is in the Midwest, which is uh, just south of Minnesota, which is where um, uh, Dave Arneson was, the uh, co-creator of Dungeons and Dragons. And so I was right in the area. I was right in the right area for it to happen. But it never did. Uh, uh, there were a bunch of kids who were playing D&D. &D, and they were like, I was in, uh, I was in fifth grade. Um, they were like in sixth and seventh grade. They're a little bit older than me. But essentially what they were doing is that they were just, they didn't have any dice. They didn't have any character sheets. They didn't have any books. But they were playing D and D uh, by creating characters and then fighting—not real fighting, but like pantomime fighting—and uh, and there was a, a dungeon master who evaluated someone's description of their move and determined if it worked or not. And that was like—I I didn't know what that was, and I was—and they wouldn't let me play because I was too young, um, and I wasn't cool, so. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, that was my first exposure to D and D. Although that's not what D and D is, maybe right? Uh, we can go down that philosophical rabbit hole. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, Call of Cthulhu was it. It was the first thing, and it it. I'm I'm firmly convinced that your first role playing game shows you what role playing games are, and you kind of even. Even maybe on you know maybe just in the back of your head, are you know measuring role playing games to that first game? And uh, just as an exercise in thought, yeah. what do you think would have been the life of John Wick if he hadn't found the Call of Cthulhu manual? I mean, what what would have been of of you if if my first exposure had been D and D, or if you hadn't example? found out about TTRPGs? Oh, geez. Uh, I would probably be in. Uh, I would probably be teaching philosophy in college. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go back to that. I, uh, probably yeah. when we talk about <laughs> Legend of the Five Rings. So yeah. uh, that's all I wanted to know because I know you get this question a lot of times. I, I heard it in interviews. <laughs> I heard you answer the same question like five different times in different podcasts in the past. Uh, 10 or 12 years. So I wanted to, to get a little bit more out of it. So now that we broke the ice, uh, Leon, if you, or Paul, if you like. Yes, of course. So 
In some of those interviews, you mentioned that having Call of Cthulhu as your first RPG changed, changes you in ways that human language really has no words to convey. <laughs> It sounds like ah. me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a quote. <laughs> so you've also mentioned that Call of Cthulhu taught you the rules are means to getting an emotional response from the players. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why was this so important to you? Well, wow. um, yeah. it because it's it feels so good, right? It's um, I did a lot of uh, storytelling, past the hat storytelling. Uh, in the United States, there used to be a storytelling circuit where you could go around the United States to go to different storytelling fairs and Renaissance fairs and things like that, right? And tell stories and pass hat and pass the hat and that's how you got fed right if you if you don't if you don't tell good stories if you don't get a good crowd then you know you're at the charity of other people on the circuit and i went on that circuit and the 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 sensation of telling stories to people and getting an immediate response from them is so gratifying there there is nothing else like it it's why actors love being on a, a, a stage instead of being in movies is because you have that immediate reaction from the audience and you can feel it right and when you're a gm and you are you know doing the gm thing and then you pull a, an unexpected twist or something on the players and you get that audible gasp right that that is a reward that is unparalleled there is nothing else like it and that's really what call of cthulhu taught me was that it's not about being a gm is not about uh presenting you know puzzles and traps and riddles and things it's about getting that emotional feedback and in cthulhu's case it's about scaring people right And a lot of that has to do with consent because people show up to a Call of Cthulhu game to be scared. They are telling you, we want to be scared. And so you are trying to fulfill that obligation. Uh, and then other games have different, have different, you know, players come to the, come to the game for different reasons. And so, you know, what I think a job of a GM is to look at a game and go, what is the emotional reaction that I am going for in this game. How do I want the players to walk away from the game and go, you know, two years later, do you remember when, you know, this happened? To me, that's the goal of game mastering. Everything else is tricks. Everything else is dice tricks and, and everything else. I just want to mention that it's a poetic beauty that you are speaking about this wearing a t-shirt that says Plato's Cave. Plato's <laughs> Cave. <laughs> yep. Here's one of my shirts. On the back of it, on the back of it, it says uh, bringing, bringing people to the light. <laughs> That's Plato's Cave is when I, when I was studying philosophy was one of my favorite my favorite um, uh, what, what would you say al allegories because it's it's so true. Right. I remember when we were making the Legend of the Five Rings collectible card game and we would go to game stores. We were literally traveling to game stores and demoing it all across the country because it was during the big collectible card game glut. Right. That when when everybody was making a collectible card game and we had to sit people down and play it with them to show them what the game was in order for them to be interested. And they would say, well, this is really fun, but I'm already invested in magic. And, and I'm like, do you know what, what the sunk cost fallacy is? Do you, do, you, do you know what that is? Do you have fun playing Magic? You know, and, you know, it was that kind of thing. So, but uh, yeah, it, it, Plato's Cave is fantastic. So a, a little bit of, of, uh, of uh, cross, cross um, you mentioned uh, Legend of the Fire Rings. And I had to go to AAG, you know. Um, there was a time where you published a lot of articles using different pseudonyms. pseudonyms. Uh, could you tell, tell us a little bit about how you started to write for Alderac Entertainment Group? Uh, 
Sure. I uh, I submitted an art. I went to a game convention out in L.A., which is where AEG uh, used to be. And I met DJ Trindle, who was the editor of Shadis Magazine, which was a magazine being published by AEG at the time. <clears throat> and they, uh, and I said, hey, are you accepting submissions? And he gave me the submission sheet. This is what we expect. So I sent an editorial called Shakespeare Didn't Use Dice, which was about diceless role playing. And uh, DJ loved it. He, he was like, oh, this is somebody who actually knows how to write. Uh, and told John Zinzer, the owner, we need to get this guy in to write articles for Shadis. And so I was brought in uh, to write articles under like seven different pseudonyms so that, you know, it wouldn't just be written by John Wick, written by John Wick, you know, all these different articles and things. And uh, then after a little while, they showed me the first draft of the Legend of the Five Rings card game which at the time didn't look anything like what the legend of the five rings card game was and by sheer again ser serendipity i was like has anyone here read the book of the five rings and like dave one one person had nobody else had read the book of the five rings and i went maybe we should read the book of the five rings <laughs> we're gonna base it on musashi right and also i brought sun tzu and and a bunch of other japanese i had all of these because one of my things in college was was uh uh zen was was a study of zen in, in in philosophy and so i had all of these different books about zen philosophy written by samurai at the you know contemporary samurai in this in the 17th century and so a lot of that went into what the card game eventually became so this is a little bit of sidetrack again but there is <laughs> an entrance on your wiki about neopets yeah uh, i wanted to ask you uh, about that because we have several people in the team that were crazy when they found out <laughs> this so how did you start working on neopets um it was chance <laughs> i uh I applied for a position at Neopets uh, for a writer, for a content writer on the website. And to get to know the website, I made a pet and I named him after a Welsh hero whose name I'm going to mispronounce, which is essentially Luch or L-U-G-G, -G, you know, the, the Welsh hero with the silver arm. And little did I know that the two people who were the creative people who were running Neopets were from Wales. I had no idea. And so they're like, so your pet's name is Lou, right? And I was like, yeah. I'm like, Oh, interesting. <laughs> so I got the job. And uh, essentially my job was to write Neopedia entries, was to do world building. So I did a whole bunch of world building. One of the things that I'm proudest of is I made the gray fairy. She's the fairy without wings. Um, I, I did. I wrote the first entry on her and wrote a story about her. And then uh, I was involved in the the war. I was involved in that thing and a few other things too. Uh, I did a whole bunch of just random content. And uh, and so that was my contribution to Neopets. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, I played it, so I was interested in this question. <laughs> so uh, going back to Legend of Five Rings, that Uh, as you told us, it started as a card game. But in recent interviews, you mentioned that from the start, the design had in mind that it would be the setting for a role-playing game. Mm -hmm. How did you end up being a designer for that role-playing game? There was a lot of people pitched a lot of ideas for what the role-playing game could look like. And I was the one who pitched the one that John Zinzer liked the most. Um, And it really came down to uh, Dave Williams and I were both big fans of the James Bond 007 role-playing game from the 80s. And one of the mechanics for that was a chase mechanic that involved betting. It, it, it involved, uh, uh, and, and so when, when both of us loved that mechanic, we were like, why didn't the whole game just use this mechanic? Because this is, this is fantastic. And so when it came time to design the L5R system, Dave and I came up with a way to 
uh, work kind of like not so much betting but is uh, bluffing right that was the whole thing behind it was well you have five dice and I have five dice but I'm going to put three of my dice aside do you want to go and it, it seemed it had the kind of bravado that that samurai of the time would have and that's really what 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 brought that about and um, it and people liked it so so many people liked it so like legend of the five rings was well received at the time and it won an origin award it's still shared in the memory of the ttrpg community also so like uh, matt colville for example mentions the settings as one of the best he's played in his running the game series what mm -hmm. do you think makes the game and the settings stand the the test of time <laughs> Because it's about philosophy. It's, um, you know, without knowing it at the time, I was kind of using, because a game designer has a lot of tools in their toolbox. And sometimes you use this one, sometimes you use that one. And, you know, there's a couple that you, you almost never use. But one of the ones I use a lot now are Jared Sorensen's three questions, which is what is your game about? How does your game do that? And what behaviors does your game reward? And so at the time, I was like, this is a game about honor. So there's an honor mechanic on the character sheet right there front and center. And the game is about all of the clans think that honor means a particular thing. And they're all correct. And, and they all disagree about what the most important thing is, but all of them are really the most important thing. And so that gives the players the opportunity to disagree about what honor means because you when you play l5r the card game and the role-playing game you pick a team and picking a team i think is a really big element of the game it means that people can wear the clan symbol on their arm it means that they can cosplay as as from their clan all those different things and that's really what i think the the big thing is is that not only did we give them a team to pick from we also gave them a point of view that said this is what you believe and with that i think that is why l5r fans are so fanatical also because we gave them voice in the game i think that was a really big deal you mean like when in the tournaments they had the chance yep. to influence the story and that that's precisely what Matt Colville always talks about if he, he really liked it and the setting. Uh, um, I just want to add a little comment. You are a drummer, aren't you? Because I can see the the drums yep. behind you. <laughs> yes, I I'm also learning the piano. Keyboard. Yeah. Right. I, I wanted to ask is I, I, I know that they are drums, but is that a Christmas tree as well? It works the same way? Uh, no, they're just stacked there <laughs> so okay. that it... it <laughs> so I've been... I, I had my drums and I was playing and just recently I got... There's a particular kind of arthritis that drummers oh. get. Oh. Yeah. And uh, I started feeling sharp pains in my wrist. And then I consulted my doctor and she went, okay, so the only way to fix this is surgery. Right. And I went, how about if I just rest it for a while? And she's like, <laughs> that might work. So I'm I'm letting my wrist, you know, rest for a while. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, we hope you get better with that. Yeah. So let's get back a little bit to um, this. Uh, you mentioned this wager mechanic, this yeah. uh, setting dice aside. This is something that it's present in a lot of your work. I mean, uh, you, you mentioned it right now in Legend of the Five Rings. We can see it again in in the latest edition of, of 7C. Uh, we can see it in Houses of the Blooded. Uh, mm -hmm. One can even say that even if it wasn't originally created by John Wick, it's something that is kind of a little hallmark. What do you love so much about this that it is present uh, back then and also in some of your newest work well i think that that really what it comes down to is i was talking about this with a friend of mine uh with jared actually and because uh, i'm making a new game and he was asking me you know what's your game about and i said it's about being firemen and and he was like what does that mean and i said you are the people who run into danger 
to help other people. You run into the burning building because somebody is in there. And in a way, all of my games are about that. It's like, um, I don't like playing, I'm gonna pick on somebody, but it, it it's a game that I really like. But these days I don't like playing vampire because it's all about being, you know, a shit. Right? It's, it's it's like, what is Vampire about? It's about eating your friends so you can take their powers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> when, when Vampire first came out, it was about trying to maintain your humanity. And now nobody really cares about humanity. They just want to have powers. So, you know, I, I generally don't play that. Um, but that's kind of like what all my games are about, which is, what does it mean to be a hero? It's something that, that I... A question that I learned from Joseph Campbell in the 80s and then, you know, began studying more stuff. And, you know, he's like, he's the starting point. He's not finished, but he is the starting point for me. And then a lot of things evolve from there. And, you know, you know, uh, Socrates' whole question about the Ring of Gyges is really important to me. It was, it was the... Uh, somebody asked him about, there's a magical Greek item called the Ring of Gyges, which if you put it on, you, you turn invisible. And they asked, you know, what what good can you do with it? You know, what what moral things could you do with it? Because you could go and, you could go and uh, kill somebody, you know, you'd kill Hitler with it, right? Or you could, you know, you know do all these, you, all, all these things. And Socrates said, the only acts that are that are worth note should be done in public because if they're not done in public then you don't show other people that these things can be done right so if everything everything moral happens behind the scenes then nobody sees moral action right and so to me that 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 like was one of the first things that spawned my ideas like okay you know heroic acts have to be done in public even if they like cost you something right. and and from there it just kind of spiraled up so all of my games like even cat which is about protecting you know protecting humans from monsters that they can't see is is that's what almost all of my games are about more than clans <laughs> clans is just a gimmick yes <laughs> so um let's jump to another game of you of your games, Seven uh, C. Yeah. So how the project was born? The I'm sorry, one. what? The first, the first edition of Seven C. Uh, yeah. How, how how that project was born? So my wife at the time, Jennifer, and I were at an Italian restaurant, and she said, "I want to do a role playing game about William Blake." And uh, and I went. I don't think anybody would buy that. <laughs> But she was like, no, I want to do a game about William Blake. I want to do a game where the magic is really visceral. It's bloody. It involves opening wounds and and you know and and the kind of visceral nature of his art is what she was really talking about. And at the same time, I was thinking about doing a game which was uh what if the whole world was the Scorpion clan? Uh, and then, like that question, what does it mean to be a hero in that kind of environment where everyone is a villain and you are expected to be a villain? What happens? And so that was the kind of conversation that we had, and that eventually molded into Vodace, um, because in the end, uh, that's what Vodace is about. It's about well, first of all, it's about feminism, and then second, it's about how do you be in a how do you be a hero in a world where the villains have won? And so that that's what Seven C was going to be was just going to be Vodace, and then stuff happened, and it it kind of got out of control, and people were like, we should do all of Europe, and my primary objection was, if we do all of Europe, then like. All of the armchair historians are going to come out and say that we did everything wrong, and really? and and they did right. <laughs> Even weird things like like the like the Vendel League, right? There's like there is no way that all the merchants in Europe would get together and unify, you know, and have a united 
you know, power in Europe. And I meant, you mean like the Hanseatic League? Oh. <laughs> I, I don't know. You know, the, the whole story about the the uh, the Emperor of Montaigne going into a cobbler and insulting him, and suddenly all the merchants across Montaigne shut down. Nobody can buy anything. That's a true story. <laughs> that happened. Right? So, um, you know, so we got guff from people because I was like, nobody in America knows anything about Japan, so we can just get away with anything in The Legend of the Five Rings. <laughs> Because, you know, <laughs> but Americans think they know European history. So, you know, there's that. By the way, um, uh, the big difference between first edition 7C and second edition 7C, there's a few differences. But one of them is the handling of Castile. And uh, I understand 100% that the first edition Castile was not Spain. It was Mexico. Oh. Right? Yeah. And, uh, uh, however, like in the many years, the decade after <laughs> I had heard that many, many, many times I went, okay, let's make sure that Castile feels more like Spain this time. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was in Los Vagos. Eh. It yeah. It was so similar to El Zorro that it, it was inevitable to, to draw was, the comparison. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but... But the, the influence can be seen, and, and the difference can be seen too in the in the second edition manual. I I uh, GM second edition seven C, so I I get to play a little bit in in the new Castile. Actually, yeah. I, I have the book right here, and, and yay! This one is the Spanish version uh, from the Kickstarter. It's, it's great. <laughs> I'm I'm glad you guys like Spain. It's, it's one of the things that I do whenever I go overseas. So I went to Italy. Uh, for a game convention. I asked the guys there, I was like, hey, what do you guys think of, you know, Vodace? And they say, oh, it is perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> all the men are bastards and all the women are are witches. And I was like, okay, that's great. <laughs> right? So. So let's, uh, in in a really um, popular book about uh, TTRPG history, Shannon Applecline's Designer of Dragons, I don't know if you... Uh, had it, had it, I haven't it read it, but I do know that like there's a significant section in it. There is a there is a whole section about you. In, in about the... me? <laughs> I thought about... there was a whole section about L5R. <laughs> no, no. Of course, there is a section about L5R, and uh, but there is a, a section about Sean Wick presents, and it talks about you in general. So, but uh, Sean Applekin says, and we wanted to know if if this is uh, is uh, is true that uh, you didn't quite like the end result of a uh, 7C first edition, that it wasn't quite right, that AAC didn't quite understand the property. That That's the quote. And I wanted to ask you what, if that's true, first of all, and if so, what changed? I mean, what what was it that, that made, you, made, uh, made you say, mm, it's not exactly what I had in mind? Um, it was a long process to make 7C, uh, mainly because when we made L5R, it was very clear who was in charge of what. Um, I was in charge of story and characters. Matt Wilson was in charge of art. Dave Williams is in charge of, of mechanics. At the same time, we all felt very comfortable to walk into each other's offices and go, I have an idea. Right. But it was also like Dave Williams had a whiteboard on his wall that was other people's ideas and you could walk in and write down an, an idea and then leave it there and then Dave would write them all down and then erase it for the next day right uh, at the same time like the whole idea of of uh, calling Hida Kasada the great bear was Matt Wilson's idea Matt Wilson first drew Kachko right he did uh, her, her name was Scorpion Shugenja B was was her name was you know and I saw the art and I got really inspired and I wrote the short story Long Knives, which is in the first uh, L5R rulebook. And um, uh, so a lot of it was very delineated and 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 that worked out fine. 7C was not like that. Um, it 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 had a lot of it had a lot of people who um, it just had a lot of voices. Like like one of the things was 
I was told by one of the owners, this is a fantasy role-playing game. It has to have armor in it. And I went, it's a swashbuckling game. So it's the 1600s. So armor doesn't really exist anymore. It's the Three Musketeers. You don't see the Three Musketeers walking around in plate armor. And he was like, no, there has to be plate armor in this game. It's a fantasy game. And so, um, like, like I, so I had to figure out a way for armor to be in the game. And that's where the Eisen... Right. Uh, that's what I, what I was going to ask. That That's the origin story of the Eisen. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know how to say it in English. Drakenizen, I don't know. How Drakenizen, they, yeah. Drakenizen, well, quite well. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, that was created because a fantasy RPG needed armor. Needs armor. <laughs> what do you look so, and there are other things too. And I think that when designed by committee never works. Right, because you don't have one person going. You can have all the like, you can send as many ideas as you want, but they have to go through one person, and and uh, uh, and that's, you know, that did not happen with Seven C, which is why it Seven C First Edition feels like such a mess, to me at least. It feels like it's very unfocused, and um, doesn't really. Uh, stick to the theme, especially after I left. Right. Because after I left, the people who were writing for it were, and again, this is not a disparagement, but, but they were big White Wolf fans. And White Wolf is doing something different than what we were doing. Right. And so the game became much more morally gray. And uh, well, that's interesting, right? Because I can write morally gray games. Uh, so fact, I think L5R is clearly, um, you know, you got this big moral mess going on about what honor is. But at the same time, 7C was supposed to be about swashbuckling adventure and good versus evil. And the game be didn't become about that and instead became about aliens. So let's talk about the moment you you left AAG and in... Uh, recent years, you described uh, yourself at that moment when you then started writing the, the famous articles that ended up being uh, played here today, uh, that you were angry. I, I mean, that, yeah. that, that you had uh, things to say. So, <laughs> uh, but I want to get uh, to this question. I mean, uh, you love philosophy. Philosophy is something you studied, first mm -hmm. of all, and, and you love it. And we can see it in your T-shirt and uh, <laughs> you use it. Uh, all the time when designing TTRPGs and a part of philosophy uh, you mentioned for example uh, a fallacy here the sunk cost fallacy is yeah debate is the, the even uh, to polemicize I don't know if it it's, exists the, the word polemic in <laughs> in English well, polemic but, yeah yeah or polemic yeah well uh, do you think of yourself as someone controversial in the TTRPG space? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and why do you think yourself to be controversial? Um, well, recently, uh, uh, I I went to... So, very recently, my partner, uh, Jessica, uh, was during the, during the COVID thing, right? So, we're both working from home. And uh, she was in her office and I was outside, uh, essentially in the same place. I was playing Xbox and she was having an interview for taking a test for autism and ADHD. And I was like, is it okay that I'm here? I can go upstairs and do something. She's like, no, I don't care. So I'm playing, I'm listening to the questions, right? And they're asking questions and I'm going, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> oh shit <laughs> right like and the one that really hung me was do you have a bill that you haven't that's sitting on your desk that you haven't paid and you feel dread when you look at it and as a matter of fact there wasn't a bill but there was a letter an actual physical letter that I had meant to send for a week and every time I looked at it I felt this overwhelming sense of dread and I was like you mean this isn't just everybody <laughs> right yeah and so I, I learned very recently that, you know, I'm not neuro, I am neurodivergent. I am not on the same wavelength as some people. And so a lot of that comes down to, like, for example, 
Um, right now, like right immediately now, uh, the United States House of Representatives just uh, kicked out the Speaker of the House. Yes, Matt Gates. Right? I, I, I yeah. Matt yes. Gates uh, did the thing. And I and I was listening to the Republicans and Democrats talk about whether they should do it or not. And um, not to be too political, but uh, the Republicans are all full of shit. And I don't understand why me personally, how you can stand up and lie like that. I just don't I don't get it. What? Why would you do that? Why would you stand up and say something that was blatantly not true? Um, it's like people who, you know, say, well, you know, the world is flat. I'm like, how can you say that? How can you even come to that conclusion? I don't understand. It's not a matter of, you know, of, uh, of, of anything other than I don't understand why people wouldn't just tell the truth. Right. right. But at the same time, um, because of my college education, uh if nazis knock on your door and say are you are you hiding jews you say no of course just clearly that is clearly the right answer right um and uh uh so my whole sense of of things that are very clear to me and things that are um uh like when like fallacies are a big thing are, are, are a huge thing with me especially things like when people do things that they're not even aware of but right, right? At, at the moment you 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 say it or, or you write it do you enjoy it or or do you then suffer the consequences because when you wrote for for pyramid uh, your article was the the highest and lowest and the lowest and, uh, yeah Yeah, but uh, and I mean, someone. Th there are people that that uh, uh, honestly enjoy that that feeling, and um, there are some people like myself. I I, I can talk uh, in first person here. That when they are in the middle of of uh, a controversy, they are all like, "Oh shit! Why did I why did I write that? <laughs> Do you enjoy it? I mean, that's Sean Wick. Uh, well, the the also the, I mean. That there's a bit of it. It it fe sometimes it feels like 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 if nobody's going to say this, somebody should, right? Like the um, uh, and and at the same time, especially now, like really now, you have to be very careful about what you say because you can be very clearly or very like instantly, like you are outside. You are no longer a part of this community, right? Which I really don't like. I think that that um, it's uh, it's like it's holding people accountable. Well, what it really feels like to me is it feels like people didn't. If if I said something, like, as a matter of fact, I did. Um, I said on my Facebook, um, if it's okay to punch Nazis. I would like permission to slap psychics. <laughs> And what I mean by that, of course, is people like John Edwards, people who are like, oh, you know, uh, I'm getting an H, right? I'm getting a yeah. J. Is there someone in your past named J, right? Those kind of people. Those kind of people are clearly con men who are taking advantage of people's grief and exploiting it, right? However, Somebody, I don't know who, somebody in the game community started passing around the meme, started like passing it on and saying, John hates Romani people. All right. Okay. Uh, I don't know how you got that, but it was, you know, and I was told, you know, John, what, what do you have against, you know, the Romani people? People are now calling you a Nazi. I went, I, in my post, I was like, I'm okay with punching Nazis. <laughs> Right, so I had to make a video saying, when I made this comment, this glib comment, I was talking about this. I was not talking about the Romani people. Right, but that doesn't matter because people who don't like me can now instantly jump on that and go, "Yeah, John's a total racist." And right? uh, in a much 
smaller scale, of course, we are not talking about Nazis, but back to the TTRPG space, something like that happened with Play Dirty. I mean, it's still referenced as one, uh, well, there are two books now, right? But uh, it was still a reference as, as one of the most influential books for, for DMs, but there is a lot of people that really hate a lot of things that, that you said there. And you also kind of, um, in the, the latest edition, uh, commented on, on the way you personally changed, right? Because oh, yeah. you know, people people change and, and uh, grow and uh, change the, the way they think about, about things. So um, you've been asked in, in the past if there is anything you would uh, write differently or, or, or that, and, and we, we saw it in, in past interviews. But I wanted to ask you, if, is, is there anything you think you got absolutely wrong in the original Play Dirty articles? I mean, is there something that you say, apart from the, the anger or perhaps the tone or, or, or some of the other things? Or, or was it just uh, another way of to look at things, but you had your, your real reasons to, to say those things? I mean, is there anything in Play Dirty that you say, nah, that was not really okay? Yeah, I think that that um well the the original article was the um the champions article that talked about how i was running uh champions in such a way that i would use dis like i would use disadvantages in the game that were clearly just empty points it's a term i like to use like um there's a there's a couple of disadvantages like bad dreams or something like that. You have bad dreams, like okay, I'll take that free point, sure, right? And then turning those into something really exploitive, um, because the player's assumption is I'm just going to get away with this, and and I was like, not in my game, you're not, <laughs> right? And so and and I think that that attitude is actually falling in line with something that I've always disagreed with, which is the confrontational or antagonistic relationship between the GM and the players. And it took me years to figure out, oh, I am doing the exact same thing that I disagree with with these other people, except I'm doing it in a different way. Uh, just recently, I had, um, uh, I've been writing kind of like a, uh, a quick clickbait thing about the Ten Commandments of GMing. And one of them is uh, actually a rebuttal to the dun to the apocalypse world. You are a fan of the characters. Um, I think that's good advice. What I think better advice is you are a you are your player's friend. And so when you know you you don't do bad things to to characters without the care without the player's consent right so for example i have a player who always wants to fall in love with the villain whoever the villain is they want to have you know and i'm like i know what you are coming to to this table i know why you are here so and part of storytelling and, and part of building plot and things is to give uh, especially players, is to give players the things they want, but not in the way they expect it. And so you get um, Aristotle's surprising but inevitable, which is what he said that endings should be. Endings should be surprising but inevitable. And so when you get to the end of the story, you're like, whoa, that makes total sense. And so for me, when a player comes to the table and says, I want to fall in love with the villain, I have to come up with a way that they will get what they want, but in a way they don't expect it. That like they will not, you know, and, and whatever that is, right? And so being the player's friend means that you are looking out for them, not their characters. Their characters can go through hell. That's fine, right? But if you're a fan of the characters, that means you don't want bad things to happen to them. And then you just get Mary Sue's all over the place. Just the whole game of Mary Sue's. But if you if you're a fan of if you are your player's friend, you want to entertain them 
And that means sometimes putting their characters through things that they want or expect or, you know, that they want, but in a way that they don't anticipate. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I like that that point point of view. So changing a little bit the the subject, you developed Org World. Yeah, a game that a game about a game about polyamorous, matriarchal, cannibalistic, um, uh, 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 by uh, not even like by gender or not even by gender orcs. Right in the two thousand in two thousand and one or whatever it was, I got heat for that. <laughs> wow! Yeah, that, that... <laughs> I was at a convention and some somebody, some young kid who didn't know anything, who thought he knew everything. Because I mean, I was that age. I remember being that kid, and he was like, "Yeah, yeah, old white cis man. What have you done?" I said, "Well, in the two thousands, well, my first role playing game had no white people in it." My second role-playing game was about feminism. My third role-playing game was about bisexual, polyamorous, uh, matriar matriarchal orcs. So, what have you done? <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, your road, man. Yeah. So, well, it, I had the question reading something like again that shift the traditional focus where <laughs> orcs are the real heroes. <laughs> I think you 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 put it that better. Well it, it really came from uh John Zinzer really was the source of that of that book because he said I want to run a DD game in the AEG office and I made the joke I want to play an orc bard and he said orcs can't be bards they're evil and so I said so I went home And over the weekend, I wrote an 8,000 word article about orcs. And I gave it to him, and he went, okay, you can play an orc bard. <laughs> and, and essentially what I did was I, I took all of the evil right elements of orcs that they will screw anything, that they'll eat anything, that, you know, and all the things. I took all of the vices of orcs and turned them into virtues. They eat, they eat their own dead because they believe that if you eat something, you take on its spirit. And so our friend Joe died, and we want to carry Joe around, so we're going to eat him. So Joe's spirit comes with us wherever we go. Of course. Of course. <laughs> Makes perfect sense. <laughs> and that's where it came from. And then after I left AEG... I uh, I wrote Orc World based on based on that based on that premise. <laughs> That's amazing. So uh, a little a little thing I I had to ask. Is it true that you received a virus that deleted all the files with the word Orc during the de the development of this project? Yes, I did. And did you ever find who sent it or why? No. Well. Uh, <laughs> I, I also got um, right when I because I was doing the game designer journal at the time. I was publishing a weekly um, article about all of my design choices, layout, hiring an artist, like like the whole thing. It was like, how do you make a role playing game? Here it is. This is what I'm doing, and and it had uh, all the numbers. It had all like what everything cost, like the whole thing. And a lot of people still come to me and say, you know, I read that and I was like. This is why I became I you like demystified making a role playing game. You know, I talked about how I changed things. I'd play test them and they didn't work. And so we try something else and all that. And then uh yeah, I got a virus that deleted everything that had orc in it in the file names. Um fortunately I was keeping it on a separate drive, so you know. But um also during the journal when I said I am now ready, you know, it is now at the printer. That, the next day, I got an email from Games Workshop sending me a cease and desist for the word ORK. The, the day after I said I sent it to print. So that was vindictive, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, And so I said, uh, well, I'll tell you what, I will put a disclaimer in the front of the book that says, these are not Games Workshop orcs. 
And uh, after a little bit of back and forth, they agreed to that. So I put that in there. And I also said, these are also not the, there's another role-playing game, fantasy role-playing game at the, the time that had ORK. These are not the Shadowrun orcs. These are not the, um, <laughs> what's the fantasy version? It also spells it ORK. Um, uh, oh, geez. It's the precursor to Shadowrun or the aftermath of Shadowrun. It's the other FASA game. Um Anyway, uh, and I also said, uh, and they're also not the ORKS that appear in Beowulf. So you made a list. <laughs> I didn't want to go. I didn't have money for an attorney. <laughs> <It's> okay. <laughs> just, just, I'll put a disclaimer in there. This is that uh, they're not your orcs. That's amazing. Being honest. Like, Being being honest. Openly. <laughs> so, there is a period of your career where you develop a lot of small games. Yeah. Uh, little games, you call them. Uh, mm -hmm. What was the reasoning behind this? What were you looking for? I was at a convention with Jared Sorensen, and I was complaining, or essentially talking about L5R and 7C, and I said, you know, I designed these games, but I don't really use, like, 90% of the rules. I, I put them there because I think other people will need them. And Jared said, why don't you write a game the way you run it? And the next game I get made was Cat. Was, you know, a game uh, 32 at the time. It was 32 pages and had very simple rules where you roll dice and all of the even. You roll, it doesn't matter what kind of dice you want to roll because evens count as successes. And that's it. And, and it was a tiny little game and it's one of my best sellers. And in a lot of ways, little games like that are very, very... Uh, they're very useful to me because as a GM, I generally don't, like, I only use the rules that matter. Uh, there's a lot of rules that I'll look at. Like, I'll use the rules when I'm running a big game like L5R or even like D&D because I ran D&D last year or during the COVID thing. Um, I'm really only interested in the rules that the players put on their character sheets. If they don't put a rule on their character sheet, clearly they don't care. And there are so many rules that, you know, you can get bogged down in them. And and um, a really good example was uh, James Ernest, who is a friend of mine uh, who did Kill Dr. Lucky and and uh, Biting Off Heads and all of the cheap ass games. Right. That's that's James Ernest. He's he's really good game designer. Um, he was making a role playing game. And he was talking to me about it and he said, so I made a role playing game, but we have a problem. We're having a lot of fun and we're doing the banter and we're, we're playing in character and things. And then a fight starts and we start using the mechanic that designed and just the fun just stops. And I off being glib off the top of my head, I said, that's because a role playing game is fun in between the rules. As soon as you have to invoke rules, it means that you're disagreeing about who has the talking stick. You guys know what I mean by that? So, like, the GM has the talking stick. And the GM says, you run into a bunch of monsters. They kill you. And you're like, no, 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 no. No, they don't. I want the talking stick. So dice determines who has the talking stick. And if that's the only rule that you need, why do you need anything else? I roll dice. No, the orcs do not kill us, but we give them cookies, and now they are our friends. Could which you, is, uh, which is uh, what Jessica's approach to uh, D and D when I was running D and D, she made an orc baker, and I was like, "Well, there is no baker character class," and she's like, "Fine, I'll pick fighter, but I bake things." And so her solution to things was was uh, uh, giving people cakes. It's like, and. Uh, so, uh, are you guys familiar with the uh, Dungeon of the Raw? Uh, no, I'm not familiar. Okay. So, I, oh, you guys said you did your research. I did a whole... <laughs> um, so, during the, uh, the uh, what was it called? D23 Challenge, where you make a room for a dungeon for every year, uh, or for every day of 2023. Oh, uh, you uploaded it to your YouTube. Yep. Ah, that's so it. That's the it. Dungeon of the Raw is me going what would happen if jessica was the evil lich at the center of a dungeon <laughs> and first off she wouldn't be evil and uh second the dungeon would become more of like a rescue 
where she sends agents out. Like there's these tr trolls that are living over here and humans are going to come and kill them. Well, let's go get the trolls and bring them back and keep them in the dungeon and keep them safe. And so the dungeon becomes this huge thing of monsters who are protecting each other from adventurers who want to kill them and take their stuff. And so the dungeon, the first level of the dungeon is all of these really, really frustrating traps. Just the most frustrating things I could think of. And they're all non-lethal. And what happens is when you fall down the, the bottomless pit, you're teleported 40 miles from the dungeon over there. And there's a sign, big sign that you can't miss that says, don't come back. Right? Because Jessica wouldn't kill anything. So then... Um, the major domo of the dungeon, the, the 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 guy who runs the dungeon, is a mind flayer. And I said the reason, the way that the rod does things is, she showed up to the mind flayer and she says, "I hear you like brains." And he says, "Yes, brains are delicious." And she says, "Well, have you tried cake?" And he tries the cake and he's like, "Oh, this is fantastic!" And I read the entry for mind flayer and what I found out is that it says that when mind flayers eat brains, they get high. Right? Which means they're easily suggestible. So mind flayer culture is telling all of the mind flayers you must eat brains when they don't need to. They could eat anything they wanted. And so <laughs> the mind flayer who's now in the dungeon, he likes cake and cookies. Is that and he runs the dungeon. He, makes he, he makes sure everything well, is okay. If the hobgoblins start messing around with the with the with the bear with the uh, with the owl bears, you know he settles it out. You know all that kind of stuff. And he has a mimic. Ah! I love mimics. Mimics are the best thing ever. Um, he has a mimic who uh, acts as his spy, who goes around the dungeon. He's like, "Oh, I'm a treasure chest," and people just walk by him. So that he, so he knows what's going on in the dungeon, and uh, so that and so the adventure of the dungeon of the Ra is learning what the dungeon is all about with all these different you know monsters and things, and then the adventurers become allies of the dungeon and go out and rescue monsters and bring them back to the dungeon. So yeah. going back to to the token stick, which is something you've mentioned uh, many times in different ways. Uh, yeah. I, Houses of, of the Blooded works a little bit uh, this way with the power that yeah. players have to, to define, to tell what is happening, uh, to tell how they succeed and even how they fail, which is something yeah. you, you talk about a lot uh, recently. I, I just had one little question because I'm a fan of Houses of the Blooded. And Yay! I, there's I, one! I, no, there's, there's <laughs> a lot. And I, I have to tell, it's a game that really drives people to make Wikipedia pages, because all of the little things that the, <laughs> the players say about uh, the, their version of the band end yeah. up <laughs> in, in a notebook some, somewhere. But I have to ask this question, because, because we heard this rumor or version. Is it true that somebody really asked you if the, the band, this uh, civiliz civilization, mm -hmm. really existed? Oh, plenty of people. Really? Yeah. Well, that's the whole gimmick of the game, right? I mean, the Ven really do exist in a way. I mean, we're talking <laughs> about them, right? We wouldn't talk about something that doesn't exist. You got all platonic out there. Yeah, but, but that um, House of the Blooded is interesting because I had just moved from Los Angeles. I'd been living in Los Angeles for 20 years. And I like to tell people that in Los Angeles, wherever you look, you can see the Hollywood sign. Maybe not literally, but when you go to a when you go to a restaurant, the waiter is an actor with headshots. When you go to, you know, the club, you know, there's at least 30 people there that are all, you know, screenwriters or actors. Everyone is trying to get into Hollywood. So wherever you go, you can see the Hollywood side. And I was there for 20 years and I tried to get into the Hollywood thing and I never had the right connections and never had anything like that. So I had a couple of interviews. I got close, but I didn't get there. So I got really frustrated. And then uh, I came to a convention here in Phoenix, where I live now in Arizona. They treated me like a king. And I was saying, I'm really sick of Los Angeles. I hate Los Angeles. And my friend Jesse the Legend Foster, who you should know about because he's a legend, uh, he's like, he started a LARP at 
the an undercover LARP at the con called Move John to Phoenix. So people came up to me out of nowhere, like, hey, John, we have a spare room that you can rent for like a hundred bucks a month until you get on your feet. Or, hey, John, I'm the I'm the hiring manager at the CVS, you know, drugstore. You know, a monkey could do this work. You could do it. like out of nowhere. People were just coming up to me. And I went back to Los Angeles and uh, I was having a really bad day. And I called Jesse and I said, do you, is it true? Can I really come out there and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, absolutely. So I said, I'll be there tomorrow. And I packed up all my stuff into storage and I moved out to Phoenix the next day and never been back. Well, I've been back a couple of times, but I, I'm here in Phoenix. So That's How's of the Blood was me writing about Los Angeles. That's a, a, an amazing love story. <laughs> It's where, you know, because one of the, because the, the traits in, in House of the Butter are things like strength and courage and all that. But one of the virtues, and they're all virtues, right? So they are all things that you, that you desire to have. And one of them is beauty. Beauty is a virtue. Because in Los Angeles, beauty is a virtue in the same way that courage and honesty are. If you are beautiful, you are virtuous. Right. It's weird. It's a really weird culture. I once explained it to somebody where I was like, the difference between living in Los Angeles and anywhere else is if I invite you to my birthday party and you say yes, that means you're showing up. In Los Angeles, if I invite you to my birthday party and you say yes, what you mean is I will be there unless something cooler happens. And when you bring it up, you're like, hey, I invited you to my birthday party and you said yes. People get mad at you. They're like, hey man, this other thing came up. I had to go to this other thing. I'm like, right. oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, House of the Butter is all about LA. Yeah. If you if you read it and if you read it again that way, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So so you then uh, published Cursed of the Yellow Sign. Yeah. Or Call of Cthulhu. What's, what, what was it like to return to that system? So uh, I was at a convention recently and um, to run Call of Cthulhu. I, I, like, like I got asked to run Call of Cthulhu and I was like, okay. Um, and, uh, I, and the rolling the die and knowing exactly what the outcome was, was like revelatory. I was like, whoa. It's like, because my games are all, you roll dice, you count them, and you figure out what you do. Call of Cthulhu, you roll, you have a 75% chance of succeeding. You go and, you know, yeah. I can start from, from the beginning. So um, I was I was at a convention recently, and I was running Call of Cthulhu. And I had forgotten how cool it was to just, like the character sheet says you have a 75% chance of succeeding you roll the die and you know bang if you succeeded or failed done because all of my games have all been pretty much dice pool games because I have the curse of the dice gods the dice gods hate me uh, so all my games are you roll dice and you count and in Cthulhu it's you roll dice and you know and that was really interesting That was very, a, a, a really neat experience to go back to that. <clears throat> also, the right game where people are Nazis. Because <laughs> the first one, uh, the it's three short stories. The Curse of the Yellow Sign is three short Cthulhu things. And in the first one, you are Nazis in Africa digging for diamonds. And uh, I love handing out the character sheet. Because you have character sheets for you don't make characters you, you hand them out, and people read it and they go, "Oh, we're Nazis." Oh yeah, it's a horror game. You're Nazis, and then It's there's okay the slow punch you in the face. <laughs> yeah, and then there's the slow realization. Oh wait a minute, we're Nazis. So these guys can die in horrible, awful ways, and I don't care. Right. So I get two. I get, I get, I kill two birds with one stone. <laughs> um, okay, so now 7C second edition, right? Yeah. Uh, how 
how can to be? Uh, how 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 that happen? Um, it's complicated. Uh, but essentially, um, I talked to John Zinzer, who owned it. We made a deal. Uh, he was very because you know he was very 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 generous, and uh, I did a Kickstarter and it went through the roof. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> yeah. Uh, much too big for me to handle. It was much too big for me to handle. And uh, if I would do anything over in my life, I don't have a lot of regrets in my life. If I did anything over in my life, there is the choice of not doing stretch goals or doing stretch goals. I would have not have done stretch goals. And now when people consult me on Kickstarters, I tell them, do not do stretch goals. Just don't. Like, well, stretch goals mean, mean the no. Do not do stretch goals. Don't do anything that you aren't finished yet. That was the the biggest advice I can give. I remember uh, being in. I, I was there. I was there uh, and and seeing the stretch goal and, and was like, this is an entire library. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was. It was much too big. Yeah. So, um, but do you think uh, second edition is closer to what you to, to that Errol Flynn fantasy you wanted it to be, or? Oh uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. Um, and and um, one thing I noticed when you play this, because you played it in in an actual play, uh, I am I think that for. Geek and Sundry, perhaps I don't remember. Yeah, it was for Geek and Sundry. Uh, and when I when I watched you play it, I I had just uh, bought the the book, the rule book, and I was watching you watching you play, and I said, "Wait a minute, he's not using all the of the rules." No, so so uh, one thing I I I always wanted to ask you as as a fan of Seven C and uh, is. I mean, you you wrote a lot of rules for the game, and how quickly does it take for you to change it and say, "Now I'm going to I'm going to do it another way"? I do that with everything. I do that with with all the games that I that I run, um, especially with players who have never played them before. Uh, I'll be like, "Here is the core mechanic." Right. You roll your trait plus your skill and a d whatever, and if you roll this, then you succeed. Let's go. Let's start playing, right? And then as they get, they learn that. Then I say, okay, now let's talk about hero points. Okay, now that we got that out of the way, now let's talk about you know. So it it it. Whenever I'm teaching a game, it's really about here's the core mechanic. This is all you need, and then we start adding things onto it. And if you watch my 31 day challenge uh, videos, which is um, in the month of December, I make a different character from a different role playing game for every day of December. And I'll <laughs> Jared noticed this right away. He was like, so when you come to the system, you really just kind of hand wave it. And I'm like, yeah, pretty much. Because most role playing games are, okay, you have these dice, you roll against the target number. If you roll high enough, you succeed. Because that's what most games are, right? It's only when games like the Doctor Who role-playing game, which has the best initiative system ever, that I will yes. bring it up. <laughs> so, are you guys fans of Doctor Who? I, I know a little bit, but I know the the initiative system you're talking about—the talkers, the runners, and everything. Oh we yeah, that research. <laughs> it, it is the Doctor Who role-playing game. So the way the initiative system works is if so, if you watch the show, what happens is the Doctor runs into Daleks. He talks to the Daleks. The Daleks threaten him. He tries to do a thing, and then that doesn't work. So then he runs away, and the Daleks shoot at him. You know, or they come across him trying to fix a thing. You know, all that kind of stuff. So the way the initiative system in Doctor Who works is, it's not who has the highest dexterity. It's who is doing what. So the first thing that happens is all of the talkers go. Everyone who is talking says what they're going to do makes a roll done next is the doers is everybody who is trying to fix something turn something on turn something off they roll and then they're done the next is the runners 
Everybody who is running away gets to move. And then finally, the shooters go. And everybody shoots. That's that's a Doctor Who episode. And it's perfect. It is such an elegant... I mean, it, if you wanted to emulate the Doctor Who TV show, that's the system you would use. Because that is exactly how an episode works. And that's what I brought up in my in my 31 day video because that's a mechanic that I was like, this is fantastic. Amazing. So finishing it up, uh, how uh, how did the movie series starring Keanu Reeves affected you? <laughs> um, so a friend of mine works in Hollywood and he sent me an email with an attachment and he said, you're never going to believe this. And I open it up, and it is the cover of the John Wick script. And I was like, somebody wrote a movie about a game designer? And he's like, no. <laughs> no. And he goes, it's about your secret life. <laughs> and then eventually, you know, I, you know, I learned more and more about the movies. And then I took uh, my parents to go see it. And or actually, I, I, my parents, my friends, and the movie may as well have been a comedy because they were laughing all the way through it. John Wick is who you send to kill the boogeyman. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, how it really affected me recently, I was going to get on a plane and I was in the airport and I had gone through American security, which is crap. And I was literally putting my bag into the basket where they put it through the metal machine. So I'm, I'm, about to go through the, you know, I've gone through the whole security line and I heard John Wick, please report to the Delta desk. John Wick, please report to the Delta desk. And I'm like, did I forget my credit card there? Did I forget my ID? What? No, I have all those. And I look at the security guy and I'm like, can I get, that's me. Here's my ID. Can I get back in line? Because my flight's leaving in like 30 minutes and this line is insane. And he was like, nope, if you leave, you got to go all the way through security again. It's like, okay, crap. So I get my bag. I go down to the thing, Delta line. And I go, hey, I'm John Wick. Uh, do you guys need me? And the looks on their faces were like, uh, you're John Wick. Yeah, here's my ID. I'm John Wick. And I quickly realized that somebody had pulled a prank. <laughs> They paged for John Wick thinking, this will be funny. And so I'm like, okay, you need to get me through security. And they're like, we can't do that. Security is an independent contractor here at the airport. So we can't do anything with security. And I'm like, ah, oh, now I'm swearing like a sailor. I take particular pride in the ability to swear like a sailor. And I'm swearing all the way back up to the security line. And I'm getting ready to ask people. I'm like, hey, did you hear that call for John Wick? That's me. My plane leaves in 30 minutes, blah, blah, blah. And a security person saw me and she came up to me, the small Hispanic woman, and she came up to me and she said, is everything okay, sir? I went, no. And I told her the story and blah, 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 blah. And there is this dramatic pause. And she goes, well, we can't have John Wick wandering around angry in an airport. And so she <laughs> walked me through security up to the, up to the security thing. And I was able to get on my flight. So That's how being John Wick affected my life. Wow, that, that, that's several pranks all together. <laughs> just, just consecutive pranks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we What? miss we, we lost Fede. But... I don't know. I, I'm here. Oh. I just I I love I laughed so hard that I kicked my camera cable. So <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> I'll be back in a second. Yeah, please continue. We have only one question left. So, so okay. The... The last question that we have, uh, if I may, uh, what can we expect from Sean Wick in the future? So I'm working on a project right now that, uh, geez, what can I say about it? Uh, oh, you know what I should talk about? Have you guys heard about Play? Okay. So Play is a game that Jared Sorensen and I made. It's an analog horror game. So um, analog horror is uh, is kind of like if, if you've seen on YouTube, if you've seen The Back Rooms, uh, if you've seen the movie The Ring. Oh, look, it's Tangent. 
Hey, buddy. <laughs> um, and in the game, what you do, it's a very small game. It's like tiny. It's it's like a credit card and it's like 12 pages. And in the game, what the way we sold it at Gen Con, he was at Gen Con, I was not, is that it comes in an evidence bag. The thing that police put evidence yeah. in. And it has a VCR case. An old VCR tape case. And the rules are in it. And the premise of the game is that you are a group of people who are yourselves. So you'd be playing yourselves. And the game comes with a television remote control. A VCR control. And what you do is the premise is that you are pretending to watch videotapes that have been given to you by this shady, questionable organization. And you watch the videotapes and re you record what you see. So in the game, um, whoever has the VCR remote is camera. And they press play and they start narrating what is on the videotape. At any point, any player can say, pause. And they can take the remote control and then hit play. And then they start narrating what's on the tape. You can also hit rewind and go back to things. And the way you keep track of it is that there's a deck of prompts. So there's a deck of cards that says an old spooky barn um, an empty parking lot, uh, you know, a skull, you know, things like that. And you can use the prompts or not, but as you put the prompts down, they represent moments on the tape. And so you can hit rewind and rewind to previous moments on the tape and rewatch them. Uh, you can hit fast forward and skip through the deck to another card. And you can, and, and uh, the whole point of the game is because it's it's analog horror is to get someone to say eject because that ends the game because you eject the tape and uh that's the game again really simple yes you're playing you're playing characters who are watching really creepy videotapes and um it's one of the games actually that i'm most proud of because it's so like outside the boundaries of anything and uh, uh, it all came from Jared saying John how would you do an analog horror role playing game and then we just started talking and within an hour we had the game it's, am uh, it's amazing that the um, many things are but the, the, the finishing uh, point the eject it's like a uh, I which one was this word? Uh, it's consent. Like yeah, yeah it, that's it. The X card. That's the X card. Like it's, it's the X card. It, the core rule of uh, finishing the game is the uh, uh, a consent uh, agreement. <laughs> yep. And as a matter of fact, there is a, at the beginning of the book there is a form that everyone has to fill out that says we are here to do this. And if you, you know, if you need to get up and leave, that's fine, right? It's one of the things that, that I think the X card is a really good idea for like playing at conventions where you like, you don't know who, who you're playing with, right? But there's a, there's a part of it that rubs me the wrong way, which is if I go to see a scary movie, nobody has the right to stand up and say, stop the movie, right? If you, if, if the movie is too much for you, you can get up and leave, right? You don't say the director is abusing me, right? Now, on the other hand, I think the X card is a really good idea for, for gamers who are playing at a convention with people you don't know. And you're like, hey, stop that, right? And, and it's, it kind of, I have a lot of mixed feelings about it. Because on one hand, I'm like, I'm a big proponent of the philosophy that if it's not on your character sheet, then it's not real, right? So if it's not on your character sheet, it doesn't matter. You can put all the, the best example is when Jess Heinig 
uh, was designing Mage Second Edition Revise something, right? And um, and he put resonance on the character sheet. And resonance is what does your magic feel like? Like when I use magic, everybody smells oranges. When you use magic, the temperature drops 10%, right? All that kind of stuff, right? That was in the original version, but it was never on the character sheet. So just put it on the character sheet and people came to him and said, that's a great new mechanic. Because it's not on the character sheet, right? It's not real. So in a way, the X card is a mechanic that is on everybody's character sheet and it's real, right? On the other hand, uh, so one of the things about play was Jared and I going, how do we make the X card a mechanic? Like a real mechanic. And that was like one of the answers to it. It was like, stop. We have to stop, right? And and so that eject button became a, a not just this... Uh, what uh there's a phrase that jared uses that i like which is um oh i can't think of it it's when there's music in a movie that the characters can't hear and um, what's that diegetic right jared is on this big thing about non-diegetic mechanics right if it's not in the world then it shouldn't be a mechanic and uh, that putting the eject thing in in the game was a real way of making the X card a diegetic mechanic. So that was that. Right. And what sort of other projects uh, can we talk about? Um, perhaps some we can't, but uh, <laughs> what, what comes next? From I am Rick? working on something that is essentially um, my take on dungeon crawling. All right. Um, that I can't really talk about yet. Uh, I have been playtesting it with my patrons on my patron project, which is, you know, the John Wick at patreon.com or whatever it is. Um, go and subscribe. <laughs> I'm going to be running a playtest in like half an hour. Uh, but um, Does it involve cookies? <laughs> it... <laughs> uh, unfortunately, no. And um, so I was a big fan of the idea that Torchbearer had that dungeon crawling is an extreme sport. I, I, I like that idea. And I was working on my own kind of take on dungeon crawling. And my take on it is a little different. I think dungeon crawling is a horror game. And, uh, and there's a couple things that I've done that are... Um, you don't go into a dungeon for treasure. You, because again, you're firemen, right? You're firefighters. Let's use the gender neutral term. You're firefighters. And if you have to go into dungeon, it's probably because no one else can. And if you don't, something really bad is going to happen. So with those things in mind, I started designing a dungeon crawling game. And I'm going to be showing it off in... I'll be showing off a preview of it in a couple months. Maybe next month. Maybe maybe by October for Halloween. <laughs> well, we'll, be, we'll be paying attention to it to see how it goes. <laughs> John, thank you so much for this interview. It was really interesting, really funny too. I had a... Yay! A, <laughs> it, it, it had its really funny moments. I kicked a camera while doing it, so you have the proof right there. Uh, but uh, we learned a lot, uh, and I personally can say that that it's uh, a personal achievement for me to have interviewed you uh, as a fan. Achievement of, of unlocked. Your, achievement unlocked. Interviewed John Wick, a man of determination and sheer fucking will. We can say, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so cool. Um, thank you so much. It it, it was a, a treat. Yes. Thank you. It, it was amazing. Uh, I am going to be the most popular kid in my, my role playing group of, I don't know, 50 years ago. <laughs> I, you guys don't know what I did today. <laughs> they will not believe it. <laughs> Thank you. It was amazing. You're welcome. You're very welcome. Thank you. It's, it's, the, the game industry does not have a lot of financial rewards. So, you know, you look for, you know, praise wherever you can get. <laughs> <laughs>